Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimez. And I'm Brian Rohenbacher. We have a super exciting show for you this week. We'll be chatting with RZIM's Abdu Murray, biochemist Bazal Rana, and some others. They're here to talk about a variety of topics, including Augustine's views on the creation days, an overview of RTB's origins of life model, and the rise of post-truth. Such an important conversation to have these days. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be a great episode. But what else is going on? Before we dive into our first segment, we want to invite you to support resources like 2819 by visiting reasons.org 2819. We also want to let you know about an awesome conference coming up next year. You have the opportunity to hang out and build relationships with the RTB staff and some of the scholars. Yeah, and the best part, it'll be in Hawaii. We'll be doing this while sailing through the Hawaiian Islands. So there will be something exciting for you to discover at every port of call. Yeah, definitely. And you're going to hear brand new content from Hugh Ross, Fazal Rana, and Ken Samples. So we're really hoping you'll look into it and join us. It's June 27th through July 4th, 2020. If you'd like more information, visit inspirationcruises.com slash RBH. All right, now let's hear from astrophysicist Jeff Swearing on his new book, Escaping the Beginning. Let's check it out. Welcome to Culture Talk, where we discuss culturally relevant topics you can use to start conversations about your faith. I'm joined today with astrophysicist Jeff Swearing. Thank you for joining me. Sandra, good to be back. We are happy to talk about your brand new book, Escaping the Beginning. I know, I'm kind of excited. Yeah, it just came out, and you know what? I'm excited for readers because this is kind of a an interesting conversation for many of mm -hmm. us who aren't aware. Um, for Christians, like we understand from the very first pages in the Bible all the way through Scripture, the Bible's talking about a beginning, about in the mm -hmm. beginning, and um, we understand this because the universe was formed at God's command. Like mm -hmm. all these verses that show that there was a beginning. Um, is it possible to understand Scripture as being other than the universe out of nothing? Well, you know, it's a, it's an interesting question because I did kind of wrestle with the idea of, okay, does there need to be a beginning? You know, mm -hmm. after all, time is created, so right. why does there have to be a t equals zero? But as I've talked with my colleagues, uh, the theologian friends especially, I do really come back to the idea that there, there does seem to be this necessary thing that creation is contingent upon God, mm -hmm. that uh, that's incredibly important. But even in that, there does seem to be this need for a beginning. So mm -hmm. if you're going to get rid of a beginning, Beginning, that's going to be very problematic to maintain historic Christian doctrine in doing that. Right. And you, you said T equals zero. Is that time equals zero? Yeah, it would be time equals zero or okay. a beginning. You know, Scientifically, yeah. what does a beginning mean is a little bit of a hard thing to evaluate. Right. So from a Christian perspective, we understand that creation had a beginning. Mm -hmm. We say creation ex nihilo, that it started from nothing and mm -hmm. it was through God's hand. Um, but now we're hearing that scientists are exploring the possibility that there wasn't a beginning. You know, many of us think that that case has been settled, that there is an origin. Mm -hmm. What is prompting scientists to even delve into that, examining that the universe might not have a beginning? Well, that, that's a fair bit of what I spend my time talking about in the book mm -hmm. is, why did we think there was a beginning in the first place? And a lot of the you kind of the settled science, if you will, harkens back to Hawking and Penrose developed these theorems as if general relativity is true and if energy behaves a certain way, then as you run time backwards, eventually you run into this infinity where the laws of physics break down and that's a beginning. Mm -hmm. The reason why scientists are saying maybe there's something else is because there's reasons to think that general relativity may not be what governs the universe right at the early cases. That's where you get mm. these quantum theories of gravity. And so if that's true, then maybe the laws of physics don't break down and there was no beginning. Mm. Or maybe energy behaves differently, and that's driven by how we look at the universe. There are mechanisms we propose to explain some of the things that we see that no longer satisfy that energy condition. And yeah. so, so there are scientific reasons to think maybe we don't have the complete picture and we need to keep exploring so that we get a more complete picture. So some might say then if scientists are going back and saying, you know, maybe this, this isn't the case and maybe things don't break down, um, that might lead some people to feel like science can't be trusted because they're going back and kind of changing uh, what we thought was the case and what we thought was there was evidence for. You know, and there's people who will say that. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, science is always changing. How can we trust it? 
And it's really an inaccurate characterization. Mm -hmm. is what we're doing is we're getting a more and more complete picture as we mm -hmm. keep studying. Because very often what we do is as we study and we get a more complete picture and we start testing it, we realize, oh, there's more to this than we saw initially. Mm -hmm. And it was the increased study realized, hey, there's more to study there. Mm -hmm. What I find remarkable is if you're going to level that change there, you're going to have the same problem with Christianity. Because there mm -hmm. are things about Christianity that we're still studying and wondering right. what's going on. And the more we study, the more we know to ask questions. In each instance, though, there are these things that are pretty well established, mm -hmm. things that are going to be hard to get around one way or the other. And so mm -hmm. that's true in theology as well as science. And right. so, no, science isn't just changing willy-nilly. It's actually getting more and more complete as we study it. Right. And I think you make the distinction in your book that it isn't that science is incorrect, but that it is incomplete. Mm -hmm. And so the more we delve into and examine um, the universe around us and the record of nature, the more we mm -hmm. you know, understand um, our environment, but then the same with our theology, the more we dig deeper into that, we, we learn more about our faith and we learn more about our Exactly, beliefs. yeah. Right. You know, um, I mean, you know, even just looking at why we're even asking this question when Hawking and Penrose first came up with that theorem, if the laws of physics break down, you can't study before that. Mm -hmm. Well, now as we have ideas that maybe the laws of physics don't break down, now we actually have a tool to ask what might be going on before. Right. It's incredibly difficult and we really don't have any data that weighs in, mm -hmm. but it's now a question that we could ask that we didn't even know how to ask before. Right. And that's fascinating because then it allows us to then further investigate what's going on in our world mm -hmm. and in our universe, and then know more about our Creator, which is what we would say from a Christian perspective, that we're getting closer to knowing the Creator. Exactly. And if God is who He says He is, what He's revealed in Scripture is going to be, what we find in creation is mm -hmm. going to corroborate that. Right. And we're never going to know that if we don't go out and understand and kind of remove some of those areas. Well, maybe it could be otherwise. Right. Part of the reason why we think there's a beginning is because we spent so long trying to figure out how to get around it. And so I expect right. that trend to continue even as we go forward. So what are some of the models that are being proposed that actually escape the begin beginning? What do they look like? Well, there's kind of two classes. Mm -hmm. And one is a class where instead of the laws of physics breaking down and there's a beginning, mm -hmm. that you end up with an eternal universe, something wow. where the whole timeline is filled from positive infinity to minus infinity. Hmm. That's one class. But there's another class where there's actually a beginning, but that beginning just kind of fluctuates into existence. So there's no cause to it. So those are kind of the two general classes where we're exploring, can you really escape a beginning? Right. That's fascinating. But let's say we do find out that there is a beginning. What does that mean? I think if you end up with a beginning, mm -hmm. at the very least, that harmonizes what, what Christianity right. and the Bible has said all along. I think that's a powerful statement. Um, and if you do have a beginning, now you have to ask the question, what's actually the best explanation mm -hmm. for that? I think there are people who would say, no, it isn't God. But when, as I've looked at it and wrestled with it, to me, the best explanation for a beginning is there's a God who started it all. Right. And I think that'd be a, a great opening a conversation with someone if they're also wrestling with, mm -hmm. is there a beginning? Investigate, what does that mean? Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's a great conversation starter, mm -hmm. and you're going to get lots of, it will help you delve in to the extent the person's willing to share. You'll get a lot of insight into what they're thinking, yeah. and that always helps when you're engaging in a conversation. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. If you'd like to receive Escaping the Beginning as a thank you for your donation in the months of September and October, visit reasons.org 2819. Now we're going to head over to a Nexus clip with Abdu Murray, and he talks about a post-truth. Let's check it out. Oxford English Dictionaries in 2016 named its word of the year. And the word of the year is a word that captures the fascinations of the culture for that particular year. And in 2016, especially after the election cycle, the word of the year was post-truth. Now, post-truth was, was used, was probably coined in 1992 but it was used in 2016 2,000 times more than in previous years combined. Post-truth. Now, what does post-truth mean? Something is post-truth, or a person is post-truth, if they elevate feelings and preferences over facts and truth. They elevate feelings and preferences over facts and truth. Now, that's different than postmodernism. Okay, postmodernism denied that truth exists. If you talk to a postmodern person, they'd say there's no objective truths. All attempts at objective truths are these power moves where you're trying to exert your power over somebody else by having these truth claims. And so in order to get rid of all these power struggles in the world, just get rid of truth claims. And so there are no objective truths. Now, you can re reason with someone like that. You've all heard the reasoning when someone says there's no such thing as objective truth. You simply say, is that objectively true? 
and they quickly see that the whole thing is self-defeating. If, if it's true that there are no truths, then your statement's self-defeating. If it's false that there are no truths, then your statement itself is false. Why do you even say it? <laughs> you can reason with a postmodern person, but post-truth is different. It looks similar, but it's different. Postmodernism is dying. It's dying its death. But out of the ashes of postmodernism rises the phoenix of post-truth. Now, postmodernism denies that truth exists. Post-truth says truth does exist, but my preferences and my feelings matter more. So if you were to look at somebody and say, here's the facts and the truth, and if they clash with their preferences, they might say, that's all well and good. I don't care. They won't deny what you're saying. They'll just deny that it has any relevance to what they believe. How do you reason with that? You can't because facts and truths don't matter anymore. But there is a way. There is a way. Now, how do we get here? I think that's the important thing we have to understand. In order to reason with a post-truth culture, you have to do two things. And this is the two rubrics under which I'm going to speak today. One, you have to show them the grisly consequences of a post-truth culture. Because this is an increasingly pragmatic society. Tell me what works and what doesn't work and I'll do what works. Well, if you show them that post-truth preferences and giving free reign to your preferences doesn't work, maybe they'll abandon it. But you also have to show them that there's a substitute for post-truth, and it's the actual truth. That post-truth thinking leads to, to enslavement, but the truth itself leads to freedom. And I want to sustain both those points for you today. To hear more from our friend Abdu Murray, please visit the Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. Now it's time for RTV 101, where we discuss practical questions to help equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about a key feature of our testable creation model, once again, is Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome back, Fuzz. Krista, thanks for having me. This is such an important question because one of our core principles or distinctives here at Reasons to Believe is our testable creation model approach. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about just one slice okay. of that model, and that is the origins of life model. So let's start with a definition. What are we talking about when we talk about the origin of life? Yeah, well, when scientists use that term, what they're referring to is the events that led up to the very first appearance of cells on Earth, the very first life forms on Earth. And from an evolutionary perspective, uh, the argument would be that uh, simple me uh, molecules would have formed on the early Earth, organic materials that would have accumulated in some environment on the Earth and undergone chemical complexification and organization to ultimately evolve through a chemical evolutionary process to the very first cells. Okay, so we're talking about cellular, single-celled organisms right. live. We're not talking about whales or dinosaurs. We're right. talking about the first life forms on the early Earth. That's exactly right. Okay, and those came about some of the distinctive features of the evolutionary models, it came about through natural processes, right. chemical evolution, right. the just the right conditions on the right. surface of the earth right. so that this life could come about. That's right, and so if this explanation is valid, then one way to test it would be to ask, uh, are there chemical processes that could in principle contribute to chemical evolution and would those chemical processes operate under the conditions of the early earth? Also, evolutionary models would anticipate that the very first life forms on Earth would be extremely simple organisms and would have probably appeared over a protracted period of time, hundreds of millions of years, maybe even up to a billion years. So we would expect to see simpler life forms first mm -hmm. that then evolve into more and more complex life forms. Right. And we would expect to see some sort of process that they were kind of pre-life and then mm. life and yes, some exactly. kind of stepwise fashion there. Exactly. Okay, now when we think about the, the model from a creation model standpoint right. that we put forth here at Reasons to Believe, how, what are some of the few of the features of our approach? Yeah, sure. Well, the, the primary view that we hold is that the origin of life and the fundamental design of life is ultimately the creator's handiwork where God is intervening in a direct way to create the very first cells on Earth. So it's a rejection of this idea of chemical evolution. Also, we think that Genesis 1-2 
is the portion of the Genesis 1 creation account that is making an allusion to something akin to the origin of life or to the very first appearance of life on earth. And so out of that, we would then expect that when that the very first life forms on earth should actually, and all life on earth as a result of that, should display evidence for design uh, in biochemical systems. We, we would also expect that the very first cells would be intrinsically complex and that life would appear suddenly on the early earth without any kind of evidence of, a, of an evolutionary history leading up to those very first cells. Very good. So maybe if people aren't quite familiar with Genesis 1-2, just a couple of, of things to highlight there in that verse. One is that the Spirit of God comes to hover over mm -hmm. the face of the earth. Right. The early earth is covered with water. Right. It's dark. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, hostile, it's a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, it's interesting that these are, this is exactly what we now understand the conditions of the early earth to be. And in fact, life does appear uh, under those very conditions on the early earth. So that aspect of our model has validation from the scientific evidence. So because of the Holy Spirit's presence there on the early earth, yeah. um, that is kind of what theologically undergirds the idea that life would have been formed, right. um, fully formed, fully functional, right. not as a result of evolution that God did something to right. intervene to create the first life forms under those hostile conditions. Th yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so when we think about this, when we're talking to a non-Christian, mm -hmm. how does this approach help us in doing our personal outreach and evangelism? I know you've got a couple of decades under your belt mm -hmm. of presenting this model to um, university audiences and, and other experts. Mm -hmm. How does this model help you? Yeah, well, instead of coming across as someone who's just simply interested in critiquing the evolutionary explanation for the origin of life or, or just making some kind of case for design or a creator, what this approach does, because it emphasizes testability, each particular perspective has certain key predictions that flow out of the very nature of the, of the two different models. And then we can ask the question, what evidence that we have accumulated with regard to the origin of life best fits uh, each of the models? Which models really best fit the evidence? And so it invites people to interact with the model. It invites people to engage the model. And instead of uh, uh, essentially insisting on our particular perspective, we're inviting people to evaluate our ideas to see if it actually has merit to it. So it's a very different approach that's inviting, that's engaging. That's really helpful. So rather than, um, sometimes Christians can be very stereotypical of just Darwin bashing, but mm -hmm. this is a model that it kind of invites people to a conversation of, hey, let's look at the data. Mm -hmm. Let's look at these two competing models which one best explains the data? Yeah. If you're engaging somebody who is scientifically minded, they are going to have a high level of respect for the scientific method. And so what this approach is emphasizing is casting our, our case for a creator in scientific terms where we actually show how our model can be affirmed and how our model can be potentially falsified. And so that, again, garners respect among people who are scientifically minded. Very good. That's very helpful. And I want to encourage people to check out your book, Origins of Life, where you go into these concepts in much more detail. What we've done here is just very um, 30,000 feet, but I uh, want to encourage you to check out Fuzz's book, The Origins of Life. Now let's go over to Jeff Swearing and our Give and Take. Let's check it out. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome to Give and Take. This is the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas to help equip you to be more confident in the truth of Christianity so that you can go share it with others. Today I'm excited because I'm joined by a friend and a, and a colleague, Dr. Gavin Ortland, and we're going to be discussing what were Augustine's views on the length of the creation days. Gavin, it's good to have you here. Thanks, good to be here. So I know you've got a, a PhD in historical theology, so I think this is a great topic to discuss. And I know you're a pastor of First Baptist Church in uh, Ojai, correct? That's right, yep, you got uh, it. So I imagine you've had to have dealt with uh, the length of creation days and that topic's come up. It's often framed, though, as though, well, science has come along and said these are older, so we need to go back and reevaluate the, the length of the creation days. Is right. this really a new thing, or has this been around for a while? 
Yeah, that's where Augustine has been so helpful to me mm -hmm. because sometimes people have the idea that everyone saw the uh, interpretation of Genesis 1 and how long are these days the same way. Mm -hmm. And then in the late 18th century, early 19th century, people start discovering evidence of age right. in the earth and they think, okay, well, now we need to change our interpretation of Genesis 1. And Augustine's helpful because he had a view of Genesis 1 um, that was very different from what is sometimes assumed as kind of the default view. Okay. And his view was incredibly influential. Um, and so I think going back to the church fathers like Augustine, he lived late 4th century, early 5th century, mm -hmm. may, perhaps maybe the most influential Christian theologian in the whole history of the church. So, so this isn't just some theologian we've picked out somewhere in the past. This is right, yeah. one of the big theologians, if you will. Yeah, if so. you're wanting to kind of go mainstream, it's hard to go wrong with Augustine. Okay. Uh, he's not some fringe figure, <laughs> right, you know. No. I, and I think that's important to, to specifically articulate that. Yeah. So, so what was Augustine's view on the length of the creation days or what these creation days were? Okay, so um, he doesn't think that they're 24-hour periods of time. Okay. He thinks that these days are different from ordinary solar days. All right. Ultimately, his problem was the opposite as uh, many people today. He thought the creation week was too long, Okay. not too short. Because? He thought the whole uh, creation week needed to happen in an instant. And so he believed in instantaneous creation. Okay. And there are lots of different is reasons. That, is that something on the order or something because, you know, for God to take time is weakening his power? Or is it something There is a little that? bit of that. Yeah, there he is, thinks okay. it's a greater display of divine omnipotence for it to happen immediately. Okay. Um, but there's other things at play. There's a verse in the book called Sirach uh, that says, He who made all things at once, and he's working with that verse. Mm -hmm. There's a number of things at play. And I wouldn't want to commend everything Augustine said on this, but I find right. it interesting that um, he, you know, he because he's pretty emphatic about this point that these aren't ordinary days and they can't be. And he had a number of reasons why he felt mm -hmm. that way. He so basically he sees the whole week as a kind of framework or accommodation, kind of portraying God's creation work in terms of a Hebrew work week. Okay. And there are a number of things in the text that that led him that way. It wasn't just an external pressure from philosophy or something like that, certainly not from science, because this is before right. modern science comes along. So so is he looking at this allegorically, or, I mean, why? where does he get this in, in interpreting the text? Okay, well, so he, he writes five different commentaries on Genesis mm -hmm. throughout his life, and then he addresses it in other books as well. So okay. he, he was kind of obsessed <laughs> with Genesis. Talked a lot about it. <laughs> yeah, very interested in it. And he started off with an allegorical interpretation of Genesis, okay. and then he eventually moves to a literal interpretation of Genesis. But what's interesting is what he means by literal is basically it has historical reference. It's okay. something that happened in history. He doesn't mean literal in terms of the literary genre in which those historical events are communicated. So he doesn't mean that it has no figurative speech mm -hmm. or analogical language. So that's what he means by literal. So it's, it's more like a literary. It's like, how do we interpret this to figure out what's going on? It's not that a poem, well, I can't think of a good, a good illustration, but there, there's obviously historical content, but it's not yeah. a historical summary of the... It's not just a, a literalistic not rendering. Not just a literalistic rendering. Of, okay. Here's exactly how you could picture it happening moment by moment. There's gotcha. a level okay. of artistry in the historical narration. Okay. And there's things in the text that caused him to go that way. It wasn't just, he didn't just have this idea one day. He's wrestling with mm -hmm. things and agonizing with little details in Genesis 1, which is why I think it's helpful for us to consider. Right. Because some people act as though the interpretation of Genesis 1 is just a matter of obviousness. Right, right. It's just, it's so clear what it's saying. And to see Augustine agonizing, right. know, this great theologian kind of anxious and, and filled with angst about how to interpret this passage is kind of refreshing. It kind of gives us some breathing room. No, I, I think that's important. So, so, so he did have a literal, or literal interpretation. Or that's kind of where he ended up, um, which is a little different than literalistic, if you will. So, what what was it in the text that led him to see these as not twenty four hour days? Okay, um, there were three main things. There's a couple other minor things. The three main things, if I can try to remember them all off the top of my head mm -hmm. here, um, the light before luminaries issue. Okay. So God creates light on day one, but you don't have the luminaries like the sun and stars until day four. Right. And so Augustine is wrestling with, where's this light coming from? Gotcha. Okay. And, and, and why do we call it a 24-hour uh, 
day mm -hmm. when that what makes it 24 hours is the amount of time for the earth to rotate around the sun there is no sun yet mm -hmm. so he's thinking is the earth just suspended there and light is kind of flashing on and off gotcha. or, you know where is that coming from and then secondly um, the different usages of the term day throughout the passage especially when you get to Genesis 2 4 to 6 and the whole creation work week is summed up by in the day the Lord made the heavens and the earth mm -hmm. and then it references when no shrub had yet appeared right and he's saying wait a second we already had the plants created why is it saying no shrub has yet appeared and he's thinking that this and that really bothered him he goes on page after page in his mm -hmm. literal commentary you know you can just picture him at his desk pulling his <laughs> hair out you know how is there no shrub that's yet appeared we just right. had the plants created and then thirdly God resting on the seventh day he says clearly God doesn't get tired. Right. You know, later in Exodus, when it says God refreshed himself, right. uh, God rested and refreshed himself on the seventh day, he's saying clearly this is analogical language. There's mm -hmm. some kind of comparison being drawn to God's creative work and human activity. Right. And so that kind of opens the door to looking at other things in the passage in an analogical way for him. So those were th the three main reasons why he doesn't think it, this is just sort of ordinary solar days. Well, thanks, Gavin. I appreciate your comments. Mm. You know, often as Christians, and myself included, wrestle with how long are the creation days. And it's often portrayed as you're either accepting science or you're accepting the Bible. To me, it is very refreshing to hear that this great theologian, Augustine, was wrestling with this long before science even weighed in on the topic. And to see that uh, there is some ambiguity and some difficulty wrestling with this. Uh, what I find encouraging is that it gives me the opportunity to look and say, you know what, I can take scripture and creation very seriously and know that they actually work together. You know, and I would encourage you to go check out GavinOrtland.com and look for Gavin's article, Did Augustine Read Genesis 1 Literally? This will give you some more insight and help you be equipped to share this kind of controversial topic in a way where you can spread the gospel. That does it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it encourages you to share your faith with compassion and confidence. And don't forget to subscribe to our show and search for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 2819show. And remember, if you want the podcast version of 2819, you can get that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, and Spotify. Just search Reasons to Believe Podcast. See you next week.